and I'm Dr. Weaver. Dr. Weaver is a professor in the Departments of Pathology and Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Texas. He attended the College of William & Mary, after which he obtained his master's from Cornell. He received his PhD from the University of California at San Diego and worked as a postdoctoral fellow at Yale. Dr. Weaver's research focuses on arthropod form viruses, including mechanisms of emergence from enzootic cycles, evolution, mosquito virus interactions, and vaccine development. His research approaches include reverse genetics to identify adaptive mutations that may mediate host range changes and field studies in Africa and Latin America to understand the ecology and epidemiology of emerging arboviruses. Dr. Weaver currently serves as the director of the Institute for Human Infections and Immunity at the University of Texas Medical Branch. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Weaver. Well, thank you, Megan, and thank you uh, to the department for the invitation to come back to New York. Never difficult to twist my arm to come back where I started my virology career about 35 years ago. So I'm going to uh, go through some information on uh, the history of Zika virus, when we first dis discovered it, what we knew about it until the last 10 years. Then I'm going to talk about some of the recent outbreaks and what we've learned very recently. Most of what we know about this virus we've learned in the past six months. I'll talk a little bit about the threat to New York in particular here and uh, to the US and the Americas more in general. And then uh, we'll take a look at what the prospects are going forward for controlling the spread of this virus. So Zika virus was uh, discovered actually a long time ago in 1947 when scientists working for the Rockefeller Foundation, which was here in New York, we're studying what's called the enzootic cycle of yellow fever virus, or the forest cycle, which is a monkey mosquito cycle that was discovered a few years earlier and is the, the origin of yellow fever virus. And what they did is they took rhesus macaques and they put them in sentinel cages and took them up on platforms into the forest canopy. And some became infected with yellow fever, but one became infected by a new virus called Zika virus, which they characterized. Um, Notice that the, the original name uh, spelled with two I's. We know so little about this virus, we can't even spell it right. Uh, and this word Zika refers to the overgrown nature of the forest at least a long time ago uh, and is a, a native African word. The first cases of Zika though were not diagnosed until 1952 and in West Africa in Nigeria where a few cases were characterized as mild dengue-like illness with fever, rash, conjunctivitis, joint pains, and other flu-like symptoms. And this remains the typical clinical picture that we see of symptomatic Zika cases today. Uh, it wasn't though until about uh, the 2007 outbreak in YAP that I'll tell you about that we recognize that actually the vast majority of cases are completely asymptomatic. And then uh, what's really astounding is prior to 2007, there were only 14 cases described in the literature and in all of the world for Zika virus infection. So we knew very little about this virus and we weren't very concerned about it, obviously, with 14 cases in six decades. But that situation uh, changed, as I'll discuss in a moment. So my involvement with Zika virus began when I was studying these uh, four viruses in West Africa. And this is a quartet of viruses with virtually identical evolutionary histories and a lot of similarities in their ability to emerge and cause human disease. So these are yellow fever virus, which you may have heard recently is causing a major outbreak in Angola. There's a severe challenge to provide enough vaccine in that location. Dengue virus, which is all over the tropics, causes about 400 million human infections per year. Chikungunya virus, which arrived also in the Americas about two and a half years ago and has swept through the same regions we'll be discussing today for Zika and then Zika virus itself. So working with the Pasteur Institute in Senegal in an NIH funded uh, project, we discovered that all four of these viruses circulate in an identical cycle in Eastern Senegal, where three different species of non-human primates, Potus and African green monkeys and Guinea baboons participate as amplification hosts. And I think this was an important finding because it tells us that these viruses don't specialize on one particular species. And I think we're really just another primate and a, a large number that these viruses can use for, to give them the flexibility they need to continue circulating when herd immunity rises uh, after amplifications. And then three different mosquitoes. These are all mosquitoes that live in forest habitats. 
And one in particular, 80s first of her, we learned travels up to a kilometer or two from the forest into nearby villages and regularly infects people with Zika virus. And then uh, presumably some of these people occasionally travel to an urban environment where they encounter one of these two mosquitoes, especially Aedes aegypti and perhaps Aedes albopictus in some circumstances. And then the urban cycle can begin where now instead of non-human primates, humans are the amplification hosts and these two mosquitoes, which are urban dwelling mosquitoes, can transmit. And if you start out with a completely naive population, you can have a very explosive outbreak like we're seeing now throughout the Americas. And then most importantly, uh, people who are either asymptomatically infected or in the incubation period, before they develop symptoms, often hop on airplanes, travel all over the world and introduce the virus to new locations and off we go with a new outbreak. So this is a phylogenetic tree of the flaviviruses. Uh, just to point out, this is a very diverse group of viruses. They have uh, different modes of transmission, some in ticks, some have no arthropod vectors. But Zika is found in this group up here of viruses transmitted by 80s mosquitoes. I wanna point out a few other viruses that are familiar to you here in New York, especially uh, West Nile virus down here which is a Culex-borne virus, as you well know, in, in New York, control efforts focus on this mosquito. A Couple of other Culex-borne uh, viruses that can also cause CNS disease. And then over here, yellow fever virus, uh, which of course can cause life-threatening hemorrhagic fever. This is a recent phylogenetic tree that we uh, developed by sequencing the entire genome of a large number of strains of Zika virus and then using computer algorithms to reconstruct the evolutionary history, much like a human genealogy. And what we learned uh, actually about 10 years ago when we developed the first of these trees is that there are two main lineages of the virus that we call the African lineage and the Asian lineage here. And then within the Asian lineage, there are some older strains from Malaysia, the 2007 Yap strain, a Columbia strain we isolated from a, a case that the US Navy detected, and then French Polynesian strains. And, and all of these are strains from the Americas, from the Caribbean and Latin America. And so we can use this information to kind of reconstruct the, uh, the history of movement of the virus. We also looked at using this uh, kind of phylogenetic approach at the rate of evolution to see if there was something different about Zika, was perhaps the the appearance of the severe disease manifestations reflecting some rapid evolutionary change. And what we found was that the, the rate of evolution was really identical to that of dengue virus. So nothing unusual was happening with regard to evolutionary rates. But we can uh, summarize this information now on this map. And uh, color coded here in red are countries where antibodies in animals or people have been detected over the decades in both Africa and Asia. And in orange here are locations where the virus has been detected directly by infecting mosquitoes, primates, or people. So we knew a long time ago that the virus was widely distributed in Africa and Asia. Here is the location of the Zika forest in Uganda where the discovery was made in 1947, but we believe that the virus was circulating in Africa probably for many thousands of years before 1947 in this enzootic cycle. We think that uh, several decades ago, it was introduced from Africa into Asia, uh, but only a few human cases were ever diagnosed there. And then the real action began in 2007 when there was a small outbreak here in Gabon in Africa. And this outbreak was transmitted by Aedes albopictus mosquitoes, which we now consider one of the two main vectors of Zika virus. But the real attention started when the virus was introduced into a naive population on Yap Island in Micronesia in 2007. About 7,000 people live in Yap. The CDC estimated that the majority of them became infected. They saw the same spectrum of mild dengue-like disease, uh, but the majority of the cases were asymptomatic, about 80% in this outbreak. And that outbreak uh, ended without uh, any further evidence of transmission there. Then, uh, probably independently, again, from somewhere in Southeast Asia, the virus was introduced in 2013 into French Polynesia. And this is where the real action began and the real risk to the rest of the world started. Because now, instead of 7,000 people, we have about 200,000 people living in the archipelago. 
Many French Polynesians travel extensively by air because they're isolated. And so we had a lot of people, again, about two thirds of the population was estimated to be infected. A lot of them flying all over the region and around the world and introducing the virus into other islands and the South Pacific initially, and then into Brazil probably in late 2013. We don't know exactly what was going on between late 2013 and about uh, the spring of last year, 2015. But beginning in the spring, a large outbreak was detected in northeastern Brazil here. And then the virus very quickly spread uh, northward and southward into Central America and the Caribbean, and even spread uh, across the Atlantic into um, the Cape Verde Islands, where an outbreak occurred late last year. So the current situation with Zika here in the Americas is uh, updated frequently on the PAHO website. You can see that there are now 43 uh, countries and territories with active transmission of the virus. Um, there have been 444,000 suspected cases. Uh, this is really just making educated guesses in the absence of laboratory diagnostics. About 92,000 confirmed cases. These are diagnosed with some assays that I'll show you uh, in a moment. Nine of these have been fatal, mainly in uh, people with other underlying medical conditions. Again, the vast majority of people recover very quickly. It's a mild infection. You'd certainly rather get Zika than dengue or chikungunya unless you're a pregnant woman or your partner is a pregnant woman. And then in the US, we're now up to 1,825 imported cases. And importantly, 479 pregnant women in this country uh, have concern that they may have been infected by Zika virus. So those women are being followed very carefully. And we've seen in this country 16 cases of sexual transmission. Also in our studies in Brazil that I'll tell you more about, we're seeing a, a large disproportion between the number of men and women being infected. Women are infected at a much higher rate than men, cannot be explained by uh, differential exposure to mosquito vectors. So we think that there's a lot of sexual transmission going on in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as in these uh, travel-related cases here in the US. Now, the risk of exportation during the, the uh, Rio Olympics got a lot of press a few weeks ago when a, a group of 150 scientists sent a letter to the World Health Organization urging them to cancel the Olympics because of the risk that people would travel here, become infected, and then uh, travel to Europe, uh, Africa, Asia, other parts of the world, and introduce the virus and begin an epidemic there. In the end, I think the, the consensus in the scientific community, and especially the people who focus on studying these kind of viruses, uh, none of whom signed that letter, by the way, was that this was going to be a very small additional risk because most of the transmission this time of the year is occurring in this region. During the rainy season in the Caribbean, in Central America, there's a lot of transmission occurring, a lot of exportation of viruses to the US, to other parts of the world. And uh, my personal feeling is that this is a very small additional contribution to the overall risk, especially from these regions. So the problem with uh, Zika virus uh, was really discovered first in French Polynesia in 2013. Again, we had about 200,000 people exposed, two thirds of them became infected. And what was noticed first was that there was a 20-fold increase in the rate of Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, in infected people in French Polynesia. Um, this is a, normally an autoimmune reaction that attacks the myelin sheaths of the peripheral nerves, can lead to partial or nearly complete paralysis, uh, tends to usually resolve over a period of months or a few years. Uh, and uh, the cases were detected in French Polynesia um, and most of these people have recovered by now, but this certainly um, was the first evidence that this virus can cause any severe neurologic disease. The next problem occurred um, when the virus reached Brazil, and about a year ago, a little under a year ago, uh, a lot of physicians in northeastern Brazil began noticing that there were being uh, babies delivered with microcephaly. Now, normally in this part of Brazil or across the country, there are about 100 to 200 cases of microcephaly or simply a small circumference of the head uh, detected each year. And those are thought to be from a variety of etiologies such as herpes viruses, CMV, and so forth. But what they saw was a, a drastic increase in the number of cases. And so in the past year, there have been about 4,000 
of these cases detected in Brazil. The number keeps changing because the threshold for making the diagnosis, that is the, the, uh, the amount of, uh, of change from the normal size of the head in these as considered microcephaly has become more and more stringent because they, the Brazilians were noticing that a lot of the borderline microcephaly cases had no evidence of CNS disease at all. So the number is shrinking, but still around 4,000 at this point. And really what, um, what started to uh, get attention was that these cases were all occurring at the time when Zika virus was first detected to be circulating in the region at high levels. So it was a coincidence originally, but that coincidence was strengthened by uh, the ability to find Zika virus RNA in uh, amniotic fluid and fetal tissues in many of these cases, or to find antibody, and I'll show you more about the details of this, uh, after babies are born by sampling the cord blood. And at least in the, the group that I work with, uh, which is the Field Crews Institute and Yale University team, we're seeing about half of these babies are born with IgM. So this is really the first paper that uh, described in, in great detail the uh, really severe clinical picture of some of these cases. This was a particular case where uh, pregnant women traveled to Brazil, returned to Eastern Europe, and was eventually diagnosed by ultrasound at week 29. And uh, there was uh, severe microcephaly with calcification seen by microsound, uh, ultrasound. Uh, the pregnancy was terminated. And then uh, the, the autopsy revealed some very severe changes, such as agyria, hydrocephalus, multifocal cortical dystrophic calcifications, cortical displacement, and mild focal inflammation. And you can see some of these bright white bands here are the calcification, which occurs both in the, in the brain of the baby and in the placenta, shown here. And these are the gross specimens from the brain seeing showing the complete uh, loss of structure on the surface of the brain here. So uh, in, in this particular case, uh, Zika virus RNA was detected by PCR in many different parts of the brain. And electron microscopy was also used to reveal Zika virus particles replicating. The genome was actually completely uh, uh, sequenced from PCR amplicons to show that it had a very close similarity to Brazilian strains where the infection took place. And then immunohistochemical uh, studies to look at where Zika virus antigens occurred are shown here. The, more, the striking figures here are where the, the uh, brownish red corresponds to Zika virus antigen in infected cells. And you can see here that uh, there's very intense staining in astrocytes that extend into the subarachnoid space. Uh, in this panel D, there's staining of activated microglial cells and macrophages in the cortex and the subcortical white matter. And then on panel E here, uh, axons in a cross section of the lumbar spinal cord. So there's extensive viral replication and probably direct killing of cells by apoptosis or possibly other mechanisms. There's extensive uh, changes in the development of the brain, such as the cerebral cortex in many of these babies is extremely underdeveloped. And even those that survive pregnancy and are born um, have a very limited uh, cognitive ability, very, very poor prognosis for going forward. Many of these babies that were first diagnosed last fall have, have survived, and they're being followed very closely by studies like uh, this one with Fio Cruz and Yale. These are some of the findings from the, the study in Salvador with the Yale Fio Cruz group. Uh, just to show you that there's a, a wide variety of, of uh, lesions in the brain of these babies, shown here in numbers and percentages of cases that have been detected here. Now, it's, no, it's not just the central nervous system that's affected by these in, in utero infections. Many of these babies have severe orthopedic malformations, such as clubfoot, shown here in this baby. You can also see this is one of the more severe microcephalic uh, cases with a very shrunken uh, 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 head in this case. You'll notice also some changes in the appearance of the face in these babies. Um, there can be eye lesions. These were uh, first discovered uh, a few months ago. And most of these babies, at least in our uh, study in, in Brazil, are born completely blind. There's also extensive hearing deficits that appear to be related to damage of the auditory nerves.
And uh, there are a lot of babies that, although they don't uh, precisely fit the definition of microcephaly, they have very small uh, weights when they're born. And um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't have microcephaly. So microcephaly is really just a portion of the severe neurologic disease in these babies. Um, the retina can be very severely damaged. This typically occurs in the first trimester of pregnancy, uh, not detected, of course, until after birth when these lesions uh, have be uh, become uh, scarred and uh, never recover, leading to blindness. And actually, it was just last week that the first case of an ocular lesion was discovered in, in an adult. This was a 64-year-old Brazilian man who complained of central vision deterioration and was shown to have unilateral acute idiopathic maculopathy. This eventually resolved, and this man's sight returned to normal a few weeks later. But we're really uh, not looking very carefully at, at ocular lesions in adults and older children. There may be a lot more out there. So some of the other findings from this study in, in Salvador, um, actually looking back in time at the data, and the nice thing about this study is that this was set up by uh, Albert Coe and his Brazilian collaborators to study leptospirosis in a cohort of patients followed longitudinally in the city where uh, one of the major outbreaks of Zika occurred. So these, uh, these patients were followed prospectively. They were, uh, they were subject to frequent diagnostics. So even some asymptomatic cases were diagnosed and the patients were very carefully monitored and uh, had very good clinical records. And so looking back at the epidemiologic data, it actually looks like um, there was some microcephaly appearing as early as April 2015. This would have been uh, consistent with infections occurring in late 2014. The burden here was very high during the epidemic period, and this is a slum area, uh, one of the favelas in Salvador. So it may not be representative of the, the entire city, but about 10% of the births coming out of this cohort uh, had microcephaly attributable to Zika virus infection. Uh, but the, the clinical picture um, was not completely explained by the laboratory findings. Only about half of these cases um, had uh, evidence of virus in the blood or in the amniotic fluid or other tissues uh, by RT-PCR assays. Uh, this could possibly explain by compartmentalization of the virus or low assay sensitivity, although this assay is pretty good with its sensitivity. Uh, or possibly difference in the pathogenesis of stillborns versus live births. And then uh, IgM antibodies were detected in about half of these newborns with microcephaly versus about 2% of newborns without microcephaly. So there's a very strong association here between Zika virus infection and the appearance of microcephaly. Now, some of the more important uh, published studies to come out began looking about five months ago at the risk of a pregnant woman for her fetus developing uh, microcephaly or other severe disease outcomes. And this study was done in French Polynesia. It's interesting that during the outbreak there, there was no report of microcephaly at all. The, the Guillain-Barre syndrome was detected and reported, but there was no mention of microcephaly during the outbreak there. When the findings from Brazil began coming out, the French Polynesians went back retrospectively and looked at their data. And in fact, they did find uh, microcephaly cases here, uh, uh, seven of them between March and July of 2014, eight of them rather. And uh, again, about two thirds of the population was infected during the outbreak. They reported that the timing of these cases was best explained by the highest risk being during the first trimester. And this was the dogma for at least a month or so, was that this was a mainly a first trimester infection risk. Um, and they, they estimated, based on some modeling with these data, that the overall risk to a uh, pregnant woman who became infected for her baby developing microcephaly was about 1%, which was actually, I think it's a terrible disease, but pretty good news. Uh, many of us thought it would probably be higher than 1%. And, um, but they could not rule out, based on this small sample size, that other trimesters also imposed risk. The second paper that came out about a month later came from a study of uh, women in Rio de Janeiro, a Brazilian group here, and they detected a larger number of cases uh, by ultrasound. And what they found was something quite different. If you look at the graph here, this is the gestation period here and the number of cases with any kind of CNS disease. 
And what they found here is you can see cases occurred throughout the period of pregnancy, not just here in the first trimester, but even late during third trimester. So they noted a, a lot of different kinds of uh, uh, problems in these fetuses, uh, in utero growth restriction, with or without microcephaly, ventricle calcifications, other CNS lesions, abnormal amniotic fluid volume, or cerebral or umbilical artery flow. So a lot of different uh, uh, clinical pictures here and throughout pregnancy based on this. And their conclusion uh, looking at the data was the risk, and this was for symptomatic women, the French uh, Polynesia was for all infected women, uh, was somewhere between 1 and 13 percent. And I think that there's a consensus now that it's quite a bit higher than 1 percent in many parts of South America, but not in all parts. And these differences may reflect uh, different genetic backgrounds of the people living different parts of the world who are affected by Zika virus. Also could reflect the immune status, prior exposure to other flaviviruses. And we know, for example, for dengue that uh, immunity to one strain can enhance the disease caused by a subsequent infection with another strain. And findings like that are now being reported in vitro for Zika followed by dengue and dengue followed by Zika. We don't yet know from in vivo studies. But some of the important knowledge gaps that remain, uh, why is the virus not detected in amniotic fluid or in the blood of uh, babies when they're born in the majority of cases? What's the spectrum of disease? And I think the part of this that we're really missing is the more mild side of it. There may very well be uh, more subtle effects of, of infection that are not manifested in small heads or in, in lesions in the brain. But, uh, but much more subtle effects that we may not discover for a few years when, when the, the growth and the uh, cognitive ability of these children continues to develop, we may see uh, some problems with Zika infection that, that could not be diagnosed early on in these babies. Um, so that could, what we may be seeing is just the tip of the iceberg here. The overall risk, um, some studies suggest up to 29%. Uh, other studies suggest 1%, and I think that the true risk is probably due to a very complicated number of different factors. One that's being discussed very recently is in Brazil, in the areas where people receive yellow fever vaccination, there's a very low rate of microcephaly. And in Colombia, where most people are yellow fever vaccinated, there is a very low rate across the country compared to Brazil. And it may be that yellow fever vaccine offers some partial protection against severe Zika infection. We're, we're looking at that hypothesis now uh, in our group using a mouse model for Zika infection. So why did all this severe disease start happening after uh, Zika virus remained obscure for many decades and there was no evidence of anything other than very mild disease? Well, in my mind, there are two main hypotheses that can explain this. One is that the virus changed, that uh, sometime in the last, say, five or 10 years, the virus either adapted um, for more efficient transmission by mosquitoes, and this is at the top of my list because this is exactly what we have seen over the past few years with chikungunya virus, also emerged from the same cycle in Africa, initially into Asia, and adapted very quickly to be transmitted more efficiently by Aedes albopictus, and I'll tell you more about that mosquito in a moment. Or could there have been selection for higher levels of human viremia, which could enhance fetal infection through the placenta, uh, more infection, higher levels of virus, more chance for severe disease. And we really don't have any direct evidence for if there have been changes in the pathogenesis in humans. Um, we need to, to start working in animal models, especially in non-human primates. But the other is that nothing changed with the virus. All these viruses have the same ability to cause these diseases. And it was just when the virus got into a very large naive population, initially in French Polynesia, but eventually in the Americas where there are hundreds of millions of completely naive people, Aedes aegypti is virtually everywhere. And we, we saw such a large outbreak, so many millions of people being infected, that a low frequency of these rare severe effects suddenly raised above the baseline level for microcephaly due to CMV, herpes, and other infections to the point where it was noticed. And I think the best evidence for this is, again, that the French Polynesians, a big outbreak, over 100,000 people, still didn't notice this. So this could be going on all the time in Africa and Asia. There's no good surveillance for Zika. There, until very recently, there have been no diagnostics for Zika. 
These cases could be occurring sporadically um, uh, in, in many parts of, of those two continents and just never noticed because the systems aren't in place to detect them. A little bit about the diagnostics for Zika virus. So this is a typical pattern uh, of the, uh, the course of infection for a flavivirus. This could be dengue virus or Zika virus. So back here somewhere is when a person is infected by a mosquito bite. And then there's typically a period of incubation of a couple days to close to a week. When there's no evidence of infection, you can't vi find the virus in blood or anywhere else followed by a period of viremia. This graph is shown so that day zero is when the patient comes to see their healthcare provider. So typically patients are already at least halfway through their viremia phase. In the case of Zika, I think it's more like this because we typically see when we follow patients who are viremic that we never see an upward trend. We always see a downward trend. So uh, during this viremic phase is when we have the best chance of diagnosing these patients because there's a PCR-based test to detect the presence of viral RNA here. And this can also be done on saliva, which persists for a few weeks, or on urine, uh, even on breast milk, and in men on semen, which uh, we now know can persist for more than two months in, in men, leading to sexual transmission of uh, partner women. But so we have a good chance because we have a very sensitive and specific test to detect viremia. But once the virus is cleared from the bloodstream here with the appearance of antibodies, first IgM and then IgG, then we have to detect the infection by looking for these specific antibodies that form in response to the infection. And that's where we can have uh, problems. First of all, the test is much more complicated to implement. PCR can be implemented in any laboratory, even with modest capabilities. Uh, the, the ELISA test for either IgM or IgG is much more complex. You have to produce antigens for this test, which can be very tricky. And then the other problem is if it's a traveler, let's see a, a New Yorker flies down to the Dominican Republic for vacation. They've never spent much time in Latin America or the Caribbean before. They've probably never been infected by a flavivirus. Their first infection with a flavivirus gives us very specific results for this IgM ELISA. So it's very diagnostic. If you have a patient with no travel history, they're negative for RNA, they're negative for IgM, you can be pretty confident they were not infected by Zika virus. But if they spent a lot of time in Latin America, or even Southeast Asia, or the Caribbean, and they've been exposed to dengue, their dengue antibodies will cross-react in the Zika test and vice versa. And it, you may never be able to interpret the results of these serology tests in these patients with multiple flavivirus exposures. And then you're left really at the end here not being able to tell your patient whether or not they were exposed to Zika virus. And all you can really do is monitor them carefully by ultrasound if they're pregnant or counsel them if they're a man to avoid transmitting to their pregnant partner through the use of condoms or abstinence. Now for, uh, for diagnosing the fetus or the infant, um, during the viremia phase, sampling amnios and, uh, amniotic fluid during the later stages of pregnancy is a very good way to detect with the same assay the presence of virus. Or, or if the, the baby is born with virus in the blood, it can be detected by this method. Now, IgG assays in the baby are probably useless because that is transported across the placenta from the maternal blood supply, but IgM is not. So the chance that that fetus was infected by another virus is almost zero. And so IgM can be uh, very specifically diagnostic if you sample cord blood and find it in the infant at birth. Another finding that has come out of uh, following pregnant women is that women have a very prolonged uh, viremia that pretty much seems to be lasting throughout the course of pregnancy. So not only is that woman at risk to herself and her baby, but she's constantly at risk for mosquitoes biting and initiating transmission in appropriate places where there's Aedes aegypti. So uh, this is just some brief highlights of the current guidance by the CDC. So of course, we're mainly worried about pregnant women who really should not be traveling at all to Latin America or the Caribbean at this point if, if, they can, if there's any way they can avoid or postpone that travel. Um, but for men and women um, who get diagnosed, who have symptoms of Zika, such as uh, fever, rash, joint pain, conjunctivitis, um, they should wait at least eight weeks after their symptoms first appeared, 
before trying to become pregnant. And that's because we, we think that the virus is always cleared by that time period in a normal healthy adult. Uh, men should wait at least six months after their symptoms first appeared to have unprotected sex. There's actually some data coming out the last uh, few weeks, but a very small number of men who are being followed that the virus actually disappears from the semen around month three. So it may be that this can eventually be reduced, this recommendation, but right now it's a good idea to play it safe and recommend at least six months of protection. And then for asymptomatic patients, this is the real problem. Um, they should wait at least eight weeks uh, after possible exposure if they travel to an endemic area. And uh, uh, men who traveled did not develop symptoms should consider using condoms and abstinence uh, for eight weeks as sort of a compromise between the six month symptomatic patient and a shorter one here. And that's mainly based on the fact that the data are showing that most of these men who transmit to a female partner have symptomatic Zika infection. They have a rash, conjunctivitis, fever, and so forth. So I want to talk a little bit about mosquito vectors because really our, our only hope to control Zika virus the next uh, year or two, I would say, is by going after these, these mosquitoes. So there are two mosquitoes that appear to be important vectors of Zika virus. Aedes aegypti here. This is a mosquito that originated in Africa, spread all over the tropics many centuries ago on sailing ships. And then Aedes albopictus, which originated in Asia and only very recently was introduced to other parts of the world. 1985 into Houston, Texas was the first detection in the Western Hemisphere. Now these mosquitoes are similar in many ways. They're parts of the same subspecies, but they have important behavioral differences. And this is why we think Aedes aegypti is the best vector. It's not more susceptible than Aedes albopictus, but it has ideal behavior for transmitting a human pathogen. So it feeds almost exclusively on humans. It takes more than one partial blood meal within a reproductive cycle. Mosquitoes feed to get protein from your blood to make eggs and reproduce. And then its larvae are found almost exclusively in artificial water containers in your backyard or, or on your property. And then the adult females finally, after they emerge from the aquatic stages, they like to fly inside your house and stay there for the rest of your life if they gain entrance. So in Latin America and the Caribbean, people don't screen their windows. They, most of them cannot afford air conditioners. These mosquitoes leave the containers, they go inside, perfect access to people for the rest of their life to transmit right inside the house there. And these mosquitoes, unlike uh, Culex mosquitoes, which we worry about for West Nile, they feed during the daytime. So we really have to change our thinking about protecting ourselves from these mosquitoes. Aedes albopictus are similar, but they're not so focused on people. They feed on other kinds of animals. They usually take a single complete blood meal. They use a wider variety of larval habitats, including things like uh, tree holes. And they don't have the same tendency to want to go in our houses and stay there, but they do feed during the daytime. So we think that the behavior of Aedes aegypti makes it the much uh, more important vector for Zika. Same for dengue and same for most strains of chikungunya. But Aedes albopictus can be an important secondary vector, and especially in, in places like here in New York in temperate areas, where Aedes aegypti probably not, cannot survive our colder winters in the northeastern United States. Now there's been some recent uh, talk about Culex mosquitoes possibly also transmitting Zika virus coming out of one of the Brazilian field cruise labs. Um, and uh, so we've been looking carefully at this because if, if Culex mosquitoes are transmitting, our control approach has to be completely different. And this is very important to know. And fortunately, there's a little bit of good news here. Um, this group from the University of Wisconsin did experimental infections of Culex pipians, which is the most important species here in New York City and it's completely refractory to Zika virus infection. And we've been testing Culex quincofasciatus, which is the southern form of this mosquito, the most common mosquito in any tropical city. And we found uh, no infection after large oral doses as uh, compared to Aedes aegypti, which is very susceptible and has virus in its saliva by seven days and even more by 14 days after an infectious blood meal. So the good news is that Culex, at least here in the United States, are probably not mosquitoes we need to worry about for Zika. Also, uh, the, the first uh, outbreak in southern Mexico, which we studied with the Mexican Mel uh, um, Health Ministry there, 
we collected mosquitoes right in the homes of infected people who were diagnosed locally at a clinic, and we found large numbers of Aedes aegypti infected, uh, in, in very high infection rates in these uh, two different cities. We collected very similar numbers of Culex quinquefasciatus, about 500, and we found no infection at all. So all the data is pointing towards Aedes aegypti being the most important vector in the tropics. This is the latest uh, map put out by the CDC for where they believe these two mosquitoes occur. And I want to point out that in blue here, Aedes aegypti extends right up into New York City. However, I have uh, read everything I can get my hands on, and apparently Aedes aegypti has not been collected in the city in many years. So I'm suspicious that that mosquito really occurs here in the city. But there's no doubt that Aedes albopictus occurs even much further north in this part of the country. Just looking at our risk, I think chikungunya is a good comparison. Two years ago, we had almost 3,000 imported cases that resulted in 12 locally acquired cases in Florida, pretty much the same region that we're now seeing Zika, and one case in southern Texas. We've now seen 1825 cases of Zika, although we're missing the asymptomatic cases here, so it's actually much more. We're now up to 15 locally acquired cases in Florida, and just one more is being reported today, as suspected in uh, Palm Beach County, about 70 miles north of Miami. So it's possible the distribution is expanding. This is a map attempting to look at the risk based on several factors. One is the number of air travelers uh, returning to the United States into different cities. For example, Miami has a lot of people coming in from Latin America and the Caribbean, as does New York and then the potential abundance of Aedes aegypti. And here I think the, the orange is probably exaggerated. It probably should be yellow. Um, and so the combination of the color and the size of the circle is supposed to indicate the overall risk. And clearly Miami and Orlando are the highest risk. Houston is probably not far behind. We have a lot of Aedes aegypti. But I think New York is actually much lower risk than these southern cities here. And historically, We've only ever seen one locally acquired dengue infection, and that was uh, um, on Long Island a few years ago, probably transmitted by Aedes albopictus. So uh, the, the response in Florida has been to do extensive uh, household surveys to narrow down the locations of these 15 cases to mostly this small area here uh, called Wynwood, uh, that's north of downtown Miami. They tried for a couple weeks to do uh, local spraying out of pickup trucks, to visit people's homes, get them to discard their water containers, and they didn't seem to be affecting the mosquito populations when they went out and sampled before and after. So uh, just last week, they, they went to a more extreme measure where they sprayed an insecticide called Naled from airplanes over this area. And uh, they claim on, on their website that they had good success in knocking down Aedes aegypti there. I haven't seen the data. Um, also, the governor made the unprecedented announcement last week that all pregnant women can now be tested for Zika virus. I assume this is the PCR test only because that one's commercially available. It's much easier to run in a, a modest infrastructure laboratory. I'm not sure that they can actually run the antibody assay for for all of these women uh, in Florida. They've tested over 200,000 mosquitoes in this area. They have not found any infected. But again, I, they're kind of looking for the needle in the haystack when they're looking at such a large area here with probably millions of mosquitoes present. And the real challenge with trying to keep ahead of these kind of outbreaks is that there's a big lag involved between when the first infection occurs of a mosquito and when we know about it. So the problem is that traveler who presumably came into this area uh, was probably asymptomatic for about a week, may have become symptomatic later, maybe never became symptomatic. If they never became symptomatic, you have to wait, wait for the second round of cases. Um, if they did become symptomatic, the turnaround time for the antibody assay uh, performed at the CDC, for example, is about two weeks. So there you've lost three weeks already. The virus has gone from that initial traveler throughout this area here. Now it's much more difficult to control it. If we could identify cases and treat their household in the immediate surrounding neighborhood, we could probably do a much better job of trying to control these kind of outbreaks, which I think the control efforts here have added up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars now in Florida. 
So what are our prospects for controlling this outbreak? And, and unfortunately, and I'm going to add chikungunya here because there's still a lot of chikungunya in Latin America, not so much in the Caribbean. And I think for either of these, the only thing we can do in the short term is mosquito control using our traditional methods and try to educate uh, people to avoid contact with these mosquitoes. In the long term, uh, I think we can develop thera therapeutics, uh, something like immune plasma, which has been used to treat chikungunya infected pregnant women because there is, there is infection during childbirth that can lead to very severe cases of chikungunya in infants. And then uh, if a drug could be developed that was safe to use in pregnant women to, to prophylactically treat pregnant women living in endemic areas. But I think ultimately a vaccine is the answer for chikungunya and for Zika. Uh, for chikungunya, we're a little bit ahead of Zika. There are two vaccines in phase two trials now. For Zika, uh, there are several in late preclinical pre and a couple that just entered clinical trials. But there's good news and bad news for developing these kind of vaccines. The good news for Zika is we now have mouse and non-human primate models that should be useful for testing these before people. And we have a lot of experience with other flaviviruses developing vaccines in a wide different uh, range of methods. The bad news is that there are some bioinformatics studies suggesting the possibility that amino acid sequences in Zika virus proteins may have certain commonalities with human proteins and trigger an autoimmune response that could lead to Guillain-Barre. Uh, this would turn out to be very difficult to overcome for vaccine development, of course, uh, no matter what the platform involved was. Um, there may be immune enhancement. If we immunize people for Zika, could they get more severe dengue in the future? And then uh, identification of sites for phase three clinical efficacy trials. This is a major challenge because I'm afraid that by the time we're ready to do these kind of trials in a couple years from now, the outbreak will have peaked. We won't see a lot of uh, incidents in many parts of the Americas. It'll be very difficult to find a good spot where we can immunize a relatively small number of people and show protection from disease. And that's where we already are for chikungunya. And none of these companies that have produced these diseases know where to test them at this point. So uh, about 40 vaccines at different stages of development. Two of them have started uh, phase one trials. Uh, one by Invio is a DNA vaccine delivered by electroporation. You get a little needle with a little current into your arm. Apparently, it's a little bit disconcerting to have one of these, but they're tolerated okay. And then this is a pressure-based system uh, for this DNA vaccine developed uh, in the NIAID intramural laboratories. And then there's one not far behind that involves simply inactivating wild-type Zika virus to use like we do for hepatitis A vaccination. So I'm going to uh, finish it up there, uh, just mentioning a few of the people who did the work I showed you. Uh, my research group in Galveston, I, I especially want to mention Shannon Rossi, who developed our, our mouse model and has done a lot of experiments, including looking at ocular lesions now in these mice, which appear to reproduce what we see in people. Uh, Bob Tesh, who runs our reference center, along with Nikos Vasilakis. Two students, Chris Roundy and Sasha Azar, have been doing all the mosquito competence experiments. And then uh, this is uh, the Theo Cruz group that we work with, led by... Uh, Alberto Costa here, and Albert Coe is not pictured in this particular uh, photo, but he works at Yale University in the epidemiology department. So I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you.